I'm Lindy Cruz, Harry's Director, and it's my pleasure this evening to introduce our speaker, Dr. Artemis Canavar, a scholar with a long connection to Kari. Dr. Canavar began her studies in archaeology at the Aristotle University of Thessaloniki before moving to the University of Sheffield for a master's degree. Her doctoral research was undertaken at the Free University of Brussels under the supervision of Jean-Pierre Olivier, and she graduated in 2000 with a PhD dissertation entitled mm -hmm. Cretan Hieroglyphic Script of the Second Millennium Before Our Times, Description, Analysis, Functions and Decipherment Perspectives. Artemis has continued in this international vein, and since attaining her PhD, she's held postdoctoral fellowships in the UK, Germany and Austria, and worked as a contract archaeologist and researcher for the Greek Ministry of Culture. Her truly international scholarship and affinity with languages is clearly shown with fluency in Greek, English, Italian, German and French, which impresses me no end. And this extraordinary breadth of knowledge extends to ancient languages, including Greek and Latin, as well as the ancient scripts, the Cypro-Minoan and Cypro-Syllabic, the linear A and B that we'll hear about this evening. Dr. Carnivar currently holds the position of Assistant Professor in Prehistoric and Protohistoric Archaeology of the Bronze Age in the Aegean and in the Eastern Mediterranean in the Department of History and Archaeology at the University of Crete in Rethymno. Her publication record includes over 50 single and jointly authored articles on topics ranging from scripts, seals and coins to excavation reports from the Bronze Age into the classical world. She's the author of a monograph on seals, feelings, and seal impressions from Akrotiri and Thera, as well as co-editor of a volume on cypro-syllabic inscriptions. I would now like to invite Dr. Carnivar to present her lecture this evening, entitled Cretan and Cypriot Writing in the Second and First Millennia BC on Seeing and Believing. Thank you. Okay, there's a trap here. Hi, can you all hear me? That's lovely. Thank you so much, Lindy. Uh, good evening to everybody whom I can't see. It's very dark in here. Um, uh, I thank Lindy and Kari in general for the invitation. I happen to be here uh, between semesters. I stole some time and I'm here uh, visiting Kari and its wonderful library this time. No museum storerooms because it's too cold. <laughs> yes, you can't believe it, but it's it's freezing cold, especially today, I think. So um, I came here with the purpose of using the library because this is the time of uh, handbooks and companions. So I'm writing a couple of chapters on that and it's not going very well. I don't know if the library hasn't seen me that much. Uh, but I am very much, I always say yes to these things because I'm very much preoccupied with uh, how we transmit specialized knowledge uh, to our students, um, to our colleagues, other experts, not, you know, very close experts, and the public. Um, whatever that means, who has a keen interest, but sometimes uh, people just don't know how to channel this interest of theirs um, in scripts or all of our topics. So a public lecture uh, is a very good opportunity for me to share my work and my ideas with you. What I will be presenting tonight is something I wrote during the pandemic which was a prolific period for uh, some people uh, in terms of uh, writing up and finishing things that we had uh, were long overdue. So I thought I would uh, try my ideas <laughs> with you. So to start, I chose, when Lindy asked me to choose an image for my lecture, I chose uh, Mastu Anthula's <laughs> uh, joy, uh, Christine de Pizan, who is a, a very uh, a well-known scribe of the 15th century. So I want to take you back softly into the uh, older times because we're going to be speaking today about the first and the second millennium BC. So I thought I'd start with an image, um, an image that we would really like to have also from uh, prehistoric or pre-Christian periods of how our scribes looked like or who they were or how they worked. So Christine de Pizan was a, a noble woman who was widowed and because she was widowed uh, quite early she had to seek employment 
and uh, she um, she was she was she became an author. She discovered she had talent in that, and uh, the king, the king of France at the time, would um, give her a salary in order to be a scribe and a scholar. And in her time, uh, I think she's still well known. She was well known, and she was at the same time widely mocked for being a woman, of course, and doing all these things like reading and writing and publishing and describing women's uh, work in the Middle Ages. So um, this was my choice, which has very little to do with the rest of my talk. What I'm going to be speaking about tonight is a group of interrelated writing systems, uh, which um, uh, has long been established. Uh, it's a group that is split between Crete, mainland Greece, some Aegean islands, and the island of Cyprus. And it spans from the early second millennium until the late first millennium. So our modern understanding on the very existence of all these systems for which I will be speaking today and on how they relate to one another started in the 19th century and is ongoing. So initially around the mid uh, 19th century came the realization that during the first millennium BC at the time of the spread of all kinds of alphabets around the Mediterranean, there existed a writing system that was peculiar to Cyprus. It was apparently known before then, mostly through coin legends, but it was summarily mistaken for Phoenician. It soon became clear, however, that it was not a script of the alphabetic type, such as the Phoenician script, but a syllabary. That is, each sign stood for a syllable rather than a single phoneme. At a time of intense international competition between European countries, which culminated with the handing over Cyprus from the Ottoman Empire as a protectorate to the British in 1878, a wave of archaeological investigations and subsequent discoveries brought about abundance of inscriptions, especially bilingual ones, in this peculiar Cypriot syllabary, and led to its decipherment in 1874. The language recorded was recognized as a form of Greek. But it was the discovery after 1878 and the extensive excavation of a large building complex in the Kefala Hill near Heraklion in Crete after 900, which provided the necessary evidence for the existence of three writing systems in the second millennium BC in Crete. The building would be interpreted as a palace, and the site was identified with Knossos. The excavator, Arthur Evans, whose name you're going to hear many times tonight, assigned to the culture the name Minoan, and further labeled the respective script documents as belonging to the script classes he called hieroglyphic or pictographic, linear A and linear B. It was clear that he thought of them as successive phases of the same writing system, and he therefore listed them in a linear chronological fashion, in a linear chronological order. In those early days of the modern discovery of these prehistoric writing systems, it seemed that they were limited to Crete. So Evans posited the existence of a small Cretan family, let's say, of second millennium scripts, the hieroglyphic or pictographic, which we now simply call Cretan hieroglyphic, came first, said Evans, then linear A, then linear B. So it was a family of ancestors and successors. Evans was convinced even prior to his excavation of Knossos about the existence of writing in Crete before the alphabet. But his Knossos discoveries allowed him on one hand to convince the scholarly community and the public that writing did in fact exist in the Eastern Mediterranean during the second millennium BC, and on the other to formulate a more specific historical scheme. As for the Cypriot twist, discoveries in Cyprus at the time led him to posit a Cretan colonization of Cyprus where among the evidence listed was the existence of a writing system that resembled the Minoan, the Minoan one during the second millennium BC. 
Evans named it Cypro-Minoan and assumed a Minoan colonization of Cyprus. Because the scripts in Cyprus largely coincided with what was increasingly known at the time as the Mycenaean period, Evans spoke of a colonial Cypro-Mycenaean system bearing just the same fraternal relation to the Minoan linear classes A and B as they do to one another. So this time, the little Cretan family of scripts had gotten extended. It got Cypriot brothers, which resembled the linear scripts, but they all had their roots in the Cretan hieroglyphic as the evolutionary scheme of the time requested, or at least that's what Evans thought. Evans was therefore the first to identify the cypro script family and lay out a grid of connections and provenances among the writing systems that comprised it. And here you see the first of a long list of tables with comparisons of sign forms between the different writing systems, comparative tables that we still love to make today. This is one of Evans's earlier tables, uh, a far stretch we think today, but still indicative of his working methodology. You see on the left column uh, signs of the three Aegean uh, systems, which he lumped together. The middle column is the Cybermineron characters, and the right column are signs of the Cypriot syllabary of the first millennium. So since that time, since Evans's days, more discoveries and research have advanced our understanding of the changes and transitions that occurred among the family members. But Evans's basic interpretative scheme remains in place. We know of three different writing systems stemming from Crete and spreading to what is uh, today the Greek mainland of the second millennium. We know the Cypromynon script to be an offshoot of the Cretan scripts, and more specifically of Linear A, somewhere around the mid second millennium. And we know the Cypriot syllabary of the first millennium BC to be the successor of the Cypro Minoan script and the latest surviving member of the family well into the first millennium when the rest of the family had long disappeared. Of course, we disagree with some of Evans's primary convictions, such as the linear chronological succession of scripts in Crete and the Greek mainland, which is why I place here the Cretan hieroglyphic, as you can see, and linear A on the same level, looking at each other and not succeeding one another. And we are confident that we can dispense with the fantasy of a Cretan Minoan colonization of Cyprus during the second millennium, already laid out and I think refuted very successfully in a paper by Sue Sherrod. The evidence says that there was at the beginning of it all an instance of cohabitation and simultaneous use of the first two writing systems during the first half of the second millennium and nothing in our evidence supports a Cretan colonization of Cyprus in the second millennium or in any millennium for that matter. But what about the languages? As it turned out, the script family did not cover just one language group. The decipherment of the Cypriot syllabary of the first millennium demonstrated that it was used for the recording of Greek, of the Greek language, as it was to be expected based on information from ancient authors, who, which uh, referred to Greek speaking Cypriots during the first millennium. A further language was, however, identified among the syllabic texts a language that is read, but not comprehended, an unknown language, therefore, at least for now. It was conventionally dubbed Ethiocypriot, and it was attributed to people living in Cyprus before the coming of Greek speaking populations. After 1953, the decipherment of Linea B, the most ancient form of Greek was recognized in the clay Linea B tablets of Knossos and Pylos. Still, the Cretan hieroglyphic and linear A on the Cretan side and the Cypromynon writing systems on the Cypriot side remain to this day undeciphered. So it is not known which languages they recorded. It is a fact, however, that although writing when created is a technology that aims to record a language, 
It can fast become independent from it, move on to record other languages, and generally speaking, it appears to follow a trajectory different than that of the language it was originally created for. So, do languages matter when trying to understand script character interactions and changes? To a limited degree, and only in a precursory manner is my answer. What is more important are the social circumstances that prevail during a script's lifetime, since they are the ones that dictate attitudes and eventual adaptations. We cannot know the exact social parameters of prehistoric societies, but it's through their material remains that we can surmise them. So one needs to start the story of the family with writing in Crete. In the Aegean, the Cretan hieroglyphic and linear A scripts, sorry, started the family sometime in the beginning of the second millennium. Both early scripts are identified as fundamental elements of the first Cretan palatial period, which roughly dates between 1900 and 1700 BC although most of the documents are discovered in the destruction layers of the period that is its later phase. They also both survived into the beginning of the second palatial period for another hundred years, but from then on, only Linear A made it to the end of the second palaces until their demise around 450. And this is a map that also shows the expansion of Linear A outside Crete. And the family, it's a Gian branch that is, continued until the end of the 13th century through their successor, Linear B. So we have some 700 years in total, which is not a long time for a writing system. Although most scholars, myself included, tend to view the Cretan hieroglyphic as the oldest of the writing systems in question, it is far from certain if it preceded Linear A, but more importantly, how these two writing systems were affiliated. To add to the confusion, the evidence that predates all the above is a repetitive two-word phrase, let's say, attested on a number of seals, one of which you see here on the screen, known as the Arcanus formula. Arcanus in central Crete being the site where most of these seals were found. Its dating could even go as far back as the latest pre-palatial period. So, as you can understand, we're left with a question whether the processes that brought about the building of the Cretan palaces were already in place before them, or whether it was the founding of the palaces that prompted the need for the creation of writing a chicken and an egg question, if you will. So it seems that the Arcanus formula is a phrase that is also attested later under curious guises in both scripts. And it was the first speech segment to be recorded invariably and faithfully. And because the word formula, I think makes little sense in the context of writing, I prefer to call it the Arcanus inscription. Some 340 documents attest the date of the Cretan hieroglyphic, about 140 of which are stone seals or their impressions on clay. And the rest, some 200, are primarily clay administrative documents. Linear A, on the other hand, is preserved on some 1,500 documents in their overwhelming majority clay administrative ones. The late Jean-Pierre Olivier, one of the leading scholars in our field who loved numbers and statistics calculated that some 60% of the surviving Cretan hieroglyphic documents are attested on clay, whereas the corresponding percentage for linear A is about 90%. The remaining percentage of linear A documents are stone and metal objects of ritual or dedicatory character. But the fact remains that a sizable percentage of Cretan hieroglyphic inscriptions that are not incised on clay are engraved on stone seals. Since Evans's time, once more, no linear evolutionary scheme can be verified on the basis of the available today data. 
and it is datable evidence that paints a more complicated picture. We can choose to accept that the Cretan hieroglyphic was the first writing system to be invented and that the Arcanus inscription was its primal testimony. But that does not solve the problem of the cohabitation of two writing systems within roughly the same geographical area and the same chronological span. Why is it important to understand the affiliation between the Cretan hieroglyphic and Linear A? Because their godfather, Arthur Evans, appeared positive that writing had a linear development in Crete, from the simple to the more complicated, from the pictorial or iconographic to the abstract and the minimal, from images to phonetic signs. So, to his mind, the hieroglyphic or pictographic script was the first to be invented, and the more pictorial a sign was, the more primitive and therefore early in dating he deemed it to be. The succeeding linear A and linear B scripts were linear, he said, exactly because they had lost their pictorial character and had developed into the formal abstraction that is thought to be required of a phonetic sign. But as it is evident, the two linear scripts are not so linear after all. Since both linear A and B attest to multiple signs where an object prototype, let's say, is clearly visible behind many of the signs, as much as it is visible behind multiple Cretan hieroglyphic signs. This happens mostly because linear B is an adaptation of linear A. And linear A, as laid out previously, is affiliated to the Cretan hieroglyphic in ways that are not yet obvious. It is generally accepted that the terms pictographic and linear, aside by Evans, are thought of as near misnomers nowadays. It is undeniably the case that at the base of the concept of the Aegean family's sign formation lay the imitation of tangible objects, the rendering of their form or shape. As it will be argued further below, however, this principle lies not only at the beginning of writing, but it is attested persistently and meticulously until the end, that is, until linear B disappears. And it is this persistence which demonstrates the choice made on the part of the linear B scribes as late as the 13th century BC to copy object images and create new signs was a conscious one. But before getting to Linear B, the family had in the meantime branched off to Cyprus, where the Cypromynoan writing systems appeared around the mid uh, second millennium. It is suggested that one of the earliest Cypromynoan documents, a clay tablet from Enkomi, which I'm sure you all know and you see on the top left, is the visual proof we needed to interpret the beginning of writing in Cyprus as an adaptation of an already existing writing system. The discussion where the Cypromynoan scripts originated from raged on for years, but we now seem to have reached a consensus, and that is, uh, it is indeed a derivation from linear A. A new document that bears a sign in the Cypromynoan writing system on a local Cretan discoid loom weight unearthed at the site of Kalohorafi near Rethymno in northern Crete recently, gives testimony for the first time to some sort of reciprocity to the cultural exchanges that resulted in the adaptation of Linear A for the requirements of the late Cypriot society. The last act of the play involves a Cypriot family member surviving on until the third century BC by means of the Cypriot syllabary, an incontestable offshoot of the second millennium Cypromynoan scripts, which you see on the left, lower left. With regard to Evans's perception of what is pictographic and what is hieroglyphic, it has to be said that he was influenced by the appearance of Cretan hieroglyphic signs carved on stone seal faces as opposed to signs incised on clay tablets, as indicated by the percentages of script documents which I gave you before. My known seals, attested from the third millennium onwards, were a category of objects that existed long before writing was invented in Crete. 
For this, it was apparent that the accommodation of a notation system, such as a script and its signs on seals, had to abide to certain decorative principles that already existed in my known seal cliptic. But it is also evident that the use of script signs on a medium that usually hosted decorative patterns was an experiment that became creative with time. Seal inscriptions were indeed accommodated on sealed faces through a variety of choices. <laughs> At times, script signs took up the entire seal surface and thus substituted, in a sense, the usual decorative motives, as you see on the three seal faces on the right. At times, they received decorative enhancement with minute filling supplementary motives, and here you can also see that, that there's no space left empty, or that they were accompanied by decorative motives of similar size. And in some relatively rare instances, some oversized decorative motives were present and the inscription was minimized to fit the seal face, which you see on the left, this nice lady, which we think is not part of the inscription, but is a decorative motive. It is the decorative motives and script signs on seal faces of comparable sizes that have caused the flurry of literature in the last decade or so and the old discussion about the transition from images to signs has been set on the table again. What is decoration and what is writing? Most of the scholarship comes from the side of script experts who are trying to make sense of seal inscriptions that mingle with, let's call it decoration, or is decoration to be taken as writing after all? The only researcher who contributed to the topic coming from the field of seal study, Maria Anastasiado, has directed a discussion, in my opinion, to more fruitful paths through the detection and discussion of pictographic images. These are motives that accompany or resemble script signs, such as the lady in question. They narrate and communicate a message, just not a phonetic one. There's no denying that the iconographic component of the second millennium Aegean writing systems was strong since their beginning and persisted until their very end. I have argued elsewhere in a paper I published in 2015 that what appear to be random prototypes of Cretan hieroglyphic signs, such as uh, human limbs, were not in fact copying human limbs, but they were most likely copying items of small size which had some intrinsic religious or uh, ritual value, such as the figurine limbs found in Cretan peak sanctuaries. But the very process of creating signs, or after a certain point, new signs, that we see most clearly at play in the Cretan hieroglyphic realm is still there in linear A and B. Until the very end, the Aegean scripts were borrowing new images and creating new signs. This is most distinctly evident in the case of logograms that are attested in all three Aegean scripts. Evans, to quote him yet again, I told you so, uh, was correct in detecting a common vein in the writing systems he unearthed. They all have the same basic structural elements, namely a phonetic component, which uh, in this case is a syllable and a logographic or ideographic, depending on what you want to call it, in our bibliography, you will, you will find both terms. The majority of their signs stands for a syllabic phonetic value, but there is a particular category of signs that had logographic value, that is, they stood for words and their names, but usually offered no indication of on how these words were pronounced. To give a contemporaneous example of how logograms or ideograms, if you want, work, since every script has maintained them, I'm showing you the logo of the Cypriot public TV and radio, its first station. In our own alphabetic writing, we have preserved the logographic element, namely numbers. We write one, as you see here, and we actually give no indication as to how to pronounce it. I can read it as Rik Ena in my native Greek. You can read it as Rik One, Rik Eins. Rik an, rik uno, depending on your native language, and so on. 
In order to read Greek correctly in the first place, you have to know the script involved, which is the Greek alphabet. If you mistake it for the Latin alphabet, you will read it as pic. And you will, of course, be mistaken. But the logogram one is easier. We share the same logogram in different writing systems, so we all read it as we please in our own languages. And this is what logograms are good for. Ventus and Chadwick, the decipherers of Linear B, described the logograms for Linear B as either a purely visual symbol or a syllabic sign used in abbreviation. And again, I'm showing here a modern example in order to conceptualize these notions of visual logograms and syllabic or alphabetic, in this case, logograms. It is the second category of logograms that interests us here, like the parking sign on the right, because, as you understand, they require that the phonetic transcription and the assigning of phonetic values to chosen signs had already taken place previously. In all three Aegean writing systems, we encounter the same phenomenon, namely signs that double down as both syllabograms, that is signs of syllabic value, and logograms. And here you see the instance of the same sign, basically denoting textiles, uh, in all three Aegean scripts, used as a sign of phonetic value, that is, as part of a word to the left, the column on the left, and as a logogram to denote actual textile pieces to the right. The numbers show how the common system worked. In a total of a maximum of 100 syllabic signs in each of the three Aegean scripts, linear B attests to 121 logograms. Linear A attests to 84 logograms, only simple forms are counted here, linear A is quite complicated, and the Cretan hieroglyphic attests to only 33 logograms. Our data is extremely limited, and these numbers to a certain extent uh, are connected with the low number of our documents. But it is worth pointing out that linear B attests to only 10 syllabic logograms, Whereas the Cretan hieroglyphic, with its meager evidence compared to the linear B1, testifies to another 10. The percentage of syllabic logograms is therefore considerably higher in the earlier writing system than the later one. So it appears that the large majority of linear B logograms are the so called visual logograms, which you see on the screen uh, the logogram of an armor, a chariot, and a horse. Sorry. I have used the description of this phenomenon and the numbers quoted above in order to suggest that there was a progression towards a larger population of logograms in the latest of the three Aegean scripts. And perhaps surprisingly, an explicit tendency to adhere to images as sources for the creation of new signs in linear B. All this, in my opinion, demonstrates the common lineage of the Aegean scripts, as well as an inclination for concerted conservatism that is all too well known in the history of writing systems. It is also important that this observation defies and rejects Evans's notion of linear progression of the creation of writing from picture signs towards phonetic signs since phoneticism, in the sense of attribution of phonetic values to script signs, appears to have existed all along from the beginning of writing in Crete, and writing did not start as some random choice of scattered images. If this was the case in the Aegean, therefore, what was the situation further east with regard to the Cypriot scripts? As stated previously, these scripts share a common lineage with the Aegean scripts. It would be therefore fair to expect similar phenomena. The Cypriot branch seems, however, to have had minimal interaction and concern for the world of objects and images. The script logograms 
Rather, their scarcity is a case in point. The admittedly few Sarbrumainoan documents, only some 215 listed in the corpus by Olivier in 2007, and they continue to be fewer than 250, you can correct me if there are more numbers, show that logograms are almost entirely absent from the Sarbrumainoan evidence with the exception of the possible presence of logograms on the inscribed clay balls. Olivier lists only two possible logograms, both attested once each, which is a very, very low number. But it is the concomitant scarcity, scarcity of numerical entries on Cypro Minon texts that should make us cautious as to whether we actually have at our disposal the type of documents that would host logograms and numerals namely texts relating to the administrative real. An interesting suggestion is that signs attested in distinct separation on cybermineon clay balls, and you see concentration of clay balls here, could function as longograms. The common, as it seems, habit, both in the second as well as the first millennium Cyprus, to use a variety of syllabic signs as isolated marks on pottery is proposed by Silvia Ferrara as a corroborative argument in favor of her interpretation that these isolated signs could be used as a commodity indicator. The fact, however, that we do not have a viable explanation for isolated pottery marks makes it hard, if not impossible, to accept this conjecture, since this would be an effort to confirm an unknown through a second unknown. The common trait, however, of these isolated signs is that they are all known to have functioned as syllabograms. That is, even if we're willing to accept a logogrammatic function for them, this would be no instance of pictorial or visual logograms in the Cypriot Bronze Age writing. I suggest that it's through the first millennium BC evidence that we can gain a better idea of how the Cypriot scripts dealt with the matter. The classical syllabary has more text to show, some 1,300. The evidence is therefore more abandoned and we can have a better overview on the matter of logograms. It is the case also that more isolated signs, either on pottery, coins, or other media, some of which were incised or even painted, painted have now been included in the first volume of the script corpus, which came out in 2020 as part of the Inscripciones Greke series, which is right there on the right. <laughs> Their overall presence has become therefore more prominent among our evidence. Masson, Olivier Masson, in his seminal work of the Cypriot syllabary, Requei des Inscriptions Syllabiques, makes little, if at all, mention of logograms. Uh, but he notices the minimal percentage of numerals. It is on lengthy documents, such as the Idalian bronze tablet, which you see here, that some isolated signs are attested, followed by numerals. And I have encircled the few instances where we see that, but they're called abbreviations. The initial syllable, TA, appears multiple times, and it is counted, and it has been interpreted as an abbreviation of the word talenton, talent, the ingot. The Italian tablet bears the text of an agreement where the city of Italian remunerates private citizens for having helped the city through times of hardship. The text therefore specifies the amount that is to be awarded to these individuals. So meaning that this is the right kind of text where we would expect numerals to appear. Such abbreviations are also attested on administrative documents, such as an ostracon, a potsherd, with abbreviated product entries that was unearthed in Palepafos in Western Cyprus, published recently by Maria Yakovu and myself. On this ostracon, an abbreviated sign that appears to function in a logogrammatic fashion, also attested on comparable administrative ostraca from Idalion, is counted in various quantities. 
More of these isolated signs are attested among their Antidi material, another site in Western Cyprus, and they're all assumed to be the abbreviated initials of names of people who dedicated inscribed stone blocks or vessels to the deity venerated there, which now seems to have been Apollo. Finally, abbreviated names are attested on pottery that is either found in settlement contexts or put in graves to accompany the dead in various sites of Cyprus in the fifth and fourth centuries BC. It is also the case that some of these abbreviations were ligatured in a monogrammatic fashion, much like the so-called telescoped logograms of linear B. In these instances, that is abbreviations on administrative documents, on dedicatory material, as well as pottery bases, the pattern that emerges is the same. Signs that otherwise have a syllabic, purely phonetic value, are used as abbreviated probable name forms. It is the text's contextual information that help us gain an idea on what these isolated signs stood for in the Cypriot syllabary. In the first instance, that of the Palepophos administrate in Ostrakon, the context is the administrative environment that re requires the registration of products in a swift and efficient manner, of course. In the second instance, that of their Antidi dedicatory inscriptions, it is the religious environment that attests to the name of the people who dedicated the inscriptions. Finally, in the third instance, that of monographs such as this, these on pottery, were aided by the concomitants of pots that bear the full name of the deceased. And this is how we understand what the initials, these initials abbreviated form stand for. So in a nutshell, <clears throat> the picture that emerges in the Aegean and Cyprus with regard to the relationship between text and image in the respective scripts is considerably diverse. The three Aegean writing systems make extensive use of logograms a script sign category that is not meant to be central or pivotal in the writing system, but was rather meant to serve as an administrative memory aid. It is the abundance of administrative texts in Linea B that gives us a comprehensive idea of how the script dealt with the scribal need for logograms and how scribes chose to fulfill it. In the majority of cases, they resorted to objects. They drew their shape and at times, even their structural details in order to communicate the idea or the name of the item recorded. It was most clearly a tactic inherited from the Minoan scripts since both the Cretan hieroglyphic and linear A functioned under the same premise, although to a lesser degree. And it is this notable progression from a majority of syllabic logograms in the Cretan hieroglyphic to a majority of pictorial logograms in Linea B that disputes a potential evolutionary course of writing in the Aegean from what is commonly considered simple, that is images, to the more complicated process of phoneticism. It appears at times that such an estimate disguises a qualitative judgment on the part of modern researchers and accredits the script's first creator or creators in Crete with an implicit naivety, which is evidently not the case. But the situation regarding the Cypriot scripts, the offshoots of linear A in Cyprus is markedly different. Although we do have minimal evidence for the presence and use of syllabic logograms in both the cypro minoan syllabaries of the second millennium and the syllabary of the first millennium, nowhere do we see any pictorial logograms, and they're simply not there. What is commonly and perhaps simplistically considered as a simple idea in the world of writing research, namely the depiction of objects to serve as ideograms or logograms, and their rush ident identification as script fundaments is non-existent. It appears that the weight of evidence points towards the use of phonetic signs in a quasi-logogrammatic fashion, that is, as word abbreviated initials. A brief mention is due here to the divergent script tactics in the Aegean and Cyprus in the frame of scripts that otherwise belong to the same family, so to speak. 
The case has been made numerous times that the Cretan society of the second millennium made extensive use of images for a variety of purposes. Images of the time are preserved as pottery decoration, subsequently as seal decoration, and most notably as wall paintings. Images and representational scenes were favored on all kinds of media, such as the neopalatial ivory pixies from Moklos, to name but one of the latest and most impressive finds of neopalatial Crete and others that have probably not survived. The discussions on Aegean iconography in scholarship are extensive. It is therefore the case that a society that creates and consumes images was only too keen on transferring this taste to writing. And to come back to the title of my talk, they still needed to see it in order to believe it. Writing, on the other hand, by definition, requires that one is detached from the world of viewership and contemplates about linguistic structures, word sounds, and transliteration problems. It appears that in Cyprus, where no such attraction for the pictorial is attested in the second millennium BC, and you can correct me if it exists, and it has escaped my attention, it was easier for writing to dispense with its pictorial walking canes and move on to a purely phonetic concept of writing. Thank you very much for your attention. Okay, thank you so much, Artemis.